Hi, welcome to the Noise Path. Today we're going to take a look at this Fluke 345 PO clamp meter. Now I just picked this up from eBay and I wonder if it's worthwhile actually fixing this. I don't know how much these things cost. Let's take a look. All right, so we established that this thing is definitely worth fixing. It is a very expensive instrument. Uh, let's go ahead and turn it on and see what happens. It does have batteries in it. There we go. Well, that's part is good. So it is. it says that the time is lost. So there's something probably maybe a battery or maybe it was totally drained. But then nothing happens when I push these buttons. Oh, it, it did give a beep to me. But no, pressing enter doesn't do anything. Nothing else happens. Yep, so something is wrong. Okay, well, it could be as simple as just having the keyboard being bad somehow, although it did make a beep when I pressed too many buttons at the same time. But I think we're going to open it up anyway and see what happens. So here's the back of the unit, and one of the very first things I noticed is that one of the screw holes has lost its framing. So it should look something like this, and the frame has broken off, and you can see. And this means that there's actually no way to put a screw in here and close, and the screw was missing from the beginning. This could point out that it, this unit may have fallen and it, this might have broken off but this also represents a somewhat of a poor design choice by having this raised uh, cylindrical shape on top of this which is quite prone to failure but nonetheless we see that it does run on AA batteries which is quite good now we can fully open it up and so here's the unit in the inside it has two main PCBs the LCD screen is over here there is shields all around isolating everything especially the noise of the backlight and everything else from the rest of the unit I have an interesting way of connecting the main board to the voltage measurement terminals in the front. So there is a little vertical board over here. Let me see if I can focus in a little bit more. And this vertical board has a bit of protection circuitry on it, and it connects with these three little terminals and additional protection and resistance in series, and that goes into this main board. They can do this because it's only measuring voltage, but this is a very highly rated in terms of protection instrument as all flukes are. So that's interesting how they've done that. There's a separate board over here which has the power AC you can connect to it. There's also a USB port FTDI chip so they convert into some UART internally and there's two ribbon cables that go across because this also includes some of the digital functions. On it as well you can see some power supply functions. This ribbon cable over here coming in, that's coming from the loop at the top so you can only measure current from up here and you can only measure voltage from down here as these things are supposed to do power analyzing uh, functions and that's why it is done this way so we have to take it apart a little bit more and see what it looks like but I like the amount of isolation they have again this is supposed to be a very secure in terms of being able to handle high voltage I'll turn it around I forget exactly what this rating is we'll take a look in a second yeah and unsurprisingly this is 600 volts category 4 as to be expected well check this out I just simply disconnected this and flipped this over and look at this cable Half of it is staying outside. Now, maybe this happened just during the disassembly I was doing right now, or maybe this is how it was, and that could explain the lack of the connection to the buttons, because these buttons are all the way on this side, and if this cable is not connected, the main ARM processor is up here, so all the functions are on, on this board. So that would be, I wonder if that's really the only problem. That would be a really interesting thing, because this is, it would be a very lucky find, actually. But I'm going to fix this, and I'm going to measure the backup battery to see if it has any anything left on it. If not, we would replace the backup battery too, and maybe take a quick look at the board. So we can make it measure this battery that's on this motherboard here. Let's see what we get. It's at 1.9 volts or so. So this is actually a rechargeable battery, and it's soldered to the motherboard. And I believe that the reason it's reading 1.9 is because I just put in recent AA batteries in it, and it's probably recharging it. So I'm going to leave it alone. I don't think there is anything necessarily wrong with it, but we can monitor it later on if something goes wrong. Let's clean that up a little bit and put it back together and see if it works. So I realized that I was going over this a little bit quickly in the interest of time, but let me go back and describe a couple of things here which you might find interesting. So the question is, why is it that if this cable is plugged in a little bit off-center or part of it is not plugged in, you could disable the keyboard but potentially nothing else? Because there's a few other things that happen on this board over here. First of all, I tried applying power over here without the batteries, and indeed I could power on the instrument, which means there must be something going from here to the connector because part of the connector is still plugged in. But interestingly enough, I could also use the USB port. I indeed, in fact, I upgraded the firmware of the instrument and it made no difference, just to make sure there was no corruption going on or anything like that. Now, both of these are significant because that means the majority of the connection is still maintained. And the battery connections are on the other side of these board over here and here. So that's why it's important that it works from this power source as well as the batteries themselves. 
So I spent a little bit of time reverse engineering this over here, figuring out why that corner connector was particularly important for the actual keyboard here. So let's take a look. So this is an FTDI chip here that I described, and it uses this up to isolator and these two up to isolators, which are you can see they're in opposite directions, in order to provide some communication to the board. And that seems to be mostly covered in this area of the connector. There's also power going over here, which is also covered in this area of the connector. So it's just this first couple of pins here that seem to be connected to the keyboard. That's a little bit strange because the keyboard obviously has many, many buttons here and you need to typically multiplex them. So how is it that it can look at the state of all the keyboard buttons only using these few wires? Well, the answer is kind of obvious. It has to be doing it in some kind of a serial fashion. But there's no microprocessor here. So they do this in a reasonably clever way. It's probably very common, but I found it still quite interesting that they, they chose to put some of the circuits over here. So what this happens is that the host processor, which is all the way on that side, is going to send a clock signal going this way and a latch signal also going this way. This clutch and la clock and latch signal going to this chip. And this chip is nothing more than a serial uh, shift register. But what it does have, it has a parallel latch input. So you can latch input, let's say, an 8-bit digit number there, and it will serially uh, output them if you put clock in it. So that's exactly what it does. So the different combinations of the keyboards are fed into the parallel inputs of this shift register. And as you push different buttons, a variety of combination of these bits can appear here. You're basically pulling them down. And then the clock signal that comes from this side latches them out, and the serial data coming back goes all the way back to the processor. So the processor provides some clocks, then it reads the serial data coming back out, and it figures out based on that serial data, because it's applying the clock itself, which of these keys were pressed. And that's why these three pins at the beginning are so important for the keyboard, but not for anything else. Those are the ones it uses to read all the different state combinations of the keys. All right, let's give it a try. So it turns on, of course, it used to turn on too. And it very, you can see it no longer says that the battery is bad because it's been charging for a while. And it does have to zero because it can measure DC. And for that, you need to zero, of course, everything. So right now it's measuring voltage and measuring current, normal. And check it out. We now have buttons, which is great. So I already entered the time and the date, as you probably noticed. And uh, yeah, looks pretty good. So we should do a couple of measurements on it to make sure it's actually doing anything useful. But it does have some pretty cool features inside. I can see why it is quite expensive. I still think it's ridiculously expensive. But nonetheless, let's try it out. So let's do a quick experiment here. Now, this instrument is, is rated up to 2,000 amps, so obviously for very high current applications. But I'm going to connect a small load to it, relatively speaking, which is a space heater under the desk here. We're going to draw a couple of amps from it. Now, space heater is a resistive load, so we should see very good THT and also a very good power factor. You can see the cable is looped through here, and I'm also connecting these two to the input of this unit so that we can measure the voltage at the same time, and we should be able to see some of its features. All right, let's go and enable the power here. So I'm dropping about 38, 39 volts RMS into the heater. Any more than that in the cables that I'm using are really not meant for it. Even at this little voltage, let's see how much current we're drawing. I'm going to the amp setting. So we're burning about 3.3 amps RMS, which is quite significant into this heater. So this is a 1500 watts at full power. So of course, this is only a fraction of it. Now there's a lot of sub menus you can go over here. It gives you statistics and a lot of nice information. But perhaps some of its graphing functions are the more interesting things. So it has a built-in oscilloscope that gives you a time domain version of the current and the voltage, and you can see how in phase they are. That's to be expected. This is a resistive load, as I talked about before. But you can also see other information being simultaneously displayed. Like, for example, the frequency here. You can go through some of these other sub-menus, and you can see individual waveforms, you know, amps and the currents, and you can put them on top of each other on the same scale. And Fluke has some of the best kind of auto-ranging oscilloscope views of waveforms that I've ever used. They kind of always figure out the best way to show you something so you can get the information you're looking for. If you go to the next setting over here, we will get things like the THD of it. There you go. Let's see. There's a plot here. So you can see that the fundamental tone, which is at 60 hertz here in North America, is the dominant power in terms of the harmonics generated. All the other second, third, and fourth harmonics are really small in this situation. Again, because we have a resistive load. That's normal. And we can also see the same thing for the amp here. One more. And one more. We should be able to see that. There you go. This is a little bit unusual. Sometimes the zeroth harmonic, which is a DC power, comes and goes a little bit. But nonetheless, the first harmonic, again, is still dominant. You can go to the watts section. 
and here we get a power factor of one which is again what we should see considering that this is a purely resistive load so it has a lot of sub menus and a lot of interesting things you can do it also has the ability to measure three phase and it tells you how you should connect to three phase so you can log the information about that which is also quite interesting and finally it has an inrush setting and the inrush setting means that you can kind of trigger the scope the built-in function here so that you can catch what is the peak current when you turn something on and in this situation the peak current is isn't any higher than the actual steady state current but you can arm this and trigger it at a certain current value really quite neat if you want to see more of this we can certainly do more experiments about it this was just to show you that it's indeed working and there you have it i hope you enjoyed this quick video as always thanks to my patreon supporters who make all of this possible if you do like to support the channel please feel free again the channel is always free for everybody but it does help to bring these kind of videos and buy more of these broken stuff from ebay so we can repair them as always i'll see you next time